Hello and a very warm welcome. The war in Syria has produced a new confrontation between nations as Turkey responds to the killing of its soldiers with an assault on Syrian regime forces. But the blame for last week's airstrike is also being directed at Moscow. So what is Russia's goal in Syria? This is Roundtable. Hello from me, David Foster. The UN Secretary General is calling it one of the most alarming moments of the war in Syria. The fallout from the airstrike on Turkish soldiers has taken the crisis into perhaps a very much more dangerous phase. And once again, Russia is at the centre of it all. After suffering its worst military casualties in decades, Turkey has effectively declared war against the Syrian regime. If they do not immediately retreat to the border Turkey has drawn, they won't have heads left on their shoulders. But Russia, which backs Bashar al-Assad's forces, is playing a key role too in this dramatic escalation of a war that is now nearly nine years old. Russia has been giving air support to Syrian regime forces as they try to retake the country's last rebel-held areas in the northern Idlib province. Turkey has been giving its own military backing to opposition forces in the area, where violence has reportedly forced a million people to flee towards Turkey's border since December. Despite backing different sides in the war, Russia and Turkey had been cooperating closely and are both sponsors of the Astana peace process. But this latest twist in the long and sorry story of the Syrian war has caused Turkey to ask if Russia can be trusted any longer. We go first to Istanbul in Turkey, where we can say hello to Ono Erin, political analyst and author. And then we go to Moscow and Alexei Klebnikov, Middle East expert of the Russian Affairs Council. With me in the studio, Robert Fox, defence editor at London's Evening Standard. And we also welcome Sami Hamdi, editor-in-chief of the International Interest Online Publication. Um, let me come to you first of all, if I may, Ono Erim. Uh, has Russia miscalculated here, or does it have some bigger plan? There seems to be a miscalculation on Russian part in, in some degree and way, and or, or form, or, or all of it. Um, what is going on right now is I think Russia has, to a degree, undermined the, uh, the, the, the mindset of the Turkish government. And actually where it's coming from. Uh, maybe we'll have more time to talk about this, but it seems, including the uh, the, the Syrian regime government, uh, Turkey is seems to be, you know, kind of overlooking its national interests, but it's actually concerned about its national security. Uh, this entails a lot of things, and I think this is a major point where Russia is overlooking, has overlooked, Hopefully, with the uh, meeting coming up in, on March, on March 5th, in just a few days, this will be straightened out to a bearable degree. OK, so, Sammy, let me come to you. And, Alexei, I'll go to Moscow in just a moment. But, but I want to ask you, I mean, unless this was just a simple, terrible mistake, Russia had a plan uh, in allowing this to happen or, or perhaps carrying it out itself. And what would that be? What, what I have an issue with with regards to the analysis of what's been going on recently is I don't see what Russia's interest is in antagonizing Turkey uh, in this. Uh, Turkey and Russia have uh, joint investments in the Balkans. They're together on Libya. They've been discussing together on the East Mediterranean. Russia is uh, potentially the main ally for Turkey. They have the Turk Stream pipeline. And this is why I think we've made the mistake of removing the agency from Assad's forces. I think it is more likely that Assad is trying to force the Russians to choose. Assad knows that Russia, Turkey, and Iran are deciding his fate, and that he had been told by the Russians what to do. I think Assad wants to retake Idlib, is trying to get the Russians to force, uh, to choose between him uh, and the Turks. And I think for the Russians, they're sitting back and saying, look, let's calculate it. We don't lose anything. If Turkey takes Idlib, NATO are still alienating Turkey, Europe is still alienating Turkey, Turkey still needs me in the East Mediterranean and in the Balkans, and Ankara is pragmatic, they'll come back to me anyway. If he doesn't take Idlib, and oh sorry, if Assad is furious, Assad is isolated, he has no allies, he has to go back to Moscow anyway. And Turkey, in, at the end of the day, there will be a deal between the Turks and the Russians. But I don't see what Russia's interest is in antagonizing Turkey. So I think 
saying that Russia is behind it, I think doesn't quite make sense. I'll come to you about NATO, if I may, in just a moment, Robert. But let me go to Alexei, uh, first of all. And the point made by Sami here is that um, there are competing interests in the future of Syria. Russia, it would appear, and I don't know whether you agree or disagree with this, this is my question, uh, would you say that Russia is determined to be the master of Syria's fate in the end? Well, in some sense, that's definitely true because uh, Moscow has already invested quite a lot since 2015, helping uh, the uh, Syrian government to sustain power and as a regime to survive. Uh, but also really understands that alone, without uh, its partners, namely Turkey and Iran, with whom Moscow launched a successful, uh, as a provocative, uh, successful format, regional preparation format, it, cannot, uh, it won't be able to... Um, to basically uh, monetize on its successes in, in Syria, uh, basically alienating Turkey and Iran. So this is why I agree that uh, it's uh, not in Russia's interest to basically uh, sour its relations with, with Turkey and uh, antagonize it. OK, so, so perhaps it can be ironed out uh, in, in the um, very near future, but... Russia's interest in Syria extends to what degree, do you think, Alexei? Well, Russia, in the, for the future, rather. Well, Russia is in Syria to stay for at least 50 years. As we know, Russia got uh, two military bases and the contracts uh, agreements signed uh, are for 49 years with a medical uh, extension for another 25 years. So Russia is in Syria to stay. So this is why it is in Russia's best interest to make Syria not a burden, but rather an asset for itself. And you cannot do it without uh, developing or maintaining original cooperation with, with Turkey and with Iran uh, in Syria. So um, in terms of Russia staying in Syria and its interests, so mainly it's to uh, having a foothold in this region, because if you compare all other uh, regional and great powers, everyone has uh, the military bases in the region, United States, UK, France, Turkey. Only Russia didn't have a military presence uh, in the region. So now Russia can say we are on par with our uh, Western partners and okay. Turkey. And, yeah. and, and that will be when we, we talk about Tartus and what they're actually doing there on, on this on the Syrian case. But let's let's talk about NATO here. Because President Erdogan has said uh, to Emmanuel Macron, the French president, uh, I would like clear and tangible action from NATO. And Turkey is a member of NATO. What kind of action would it be hoping for, number one, or expecting, number two? They aren't going to get Article 5. Uh, they're not going to go to the maximalist position. Because uh, I'm afraid that, uh, particularly after the S-400 deal, Turkey really must be qualified now as a semi-detached member of NATO. NATO is extremely sceptical about the maximalist nationalist ambitions of uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, I'm afraid. And I also disagree with this maximalist position of Russia. Turkey, Russia, Iran, they're in, uh, above all I said, they're in a big mess in Syria. And the real worry is that this anarchy dribbles on and it becomes non-state that Syria becomes Somalia. And at the moment, I do think there will be a patched up ceasefire when they meet on March the 5th, but it will be patched up. It may break down in weeks, it may break down in days, it may break down in months, but break down it will. There are too many imponderables and variables, and it sounds like an armchair general speaking, but we do not know where the forces on the ground are going to end up in this one. Because one of the things that we're seeing in Syria now at the moment is the spectacular weakening in physical uh, military terms of the Iranian influence. Why? This is what Soleimani and Mohandis were about when they, they, they were killed. Because they haven't got the money anymore. And, and Russia's uh, looking to fill that vacuum. Uh, no, Russia will not be able to fill that uh, uh, um, vacuum. And I'd like our, our, our colleague from Moscow to say, I think that they, you know, that there's almost the invitation to overextend. And Putin has been very careful, very cautious. Very quickly, you're right to focus on Tartus, Latakia, and indeed the, the, the treaty arrangements. That's just fine. That's dandy. That's what Moscow wants. 
and not much more. And we will, we'll ask yeah. Alexia about that yeah, in, yeah, in just yeah. a moment. But I want to go back, and this is for any one of you who cares to come in. You mentioned the S-400s. These are yeah. the missile defence system that yeah. Turkey's buying. Which is predicated on Russia. downing NATO aircraft. <laughs> but <laughs> President Erdogan has apparently asked Donald Trump, or Donald Trump has volunteered to provide the Patriot missile system for the western border of, of, of Turkey. Uh, the eastern border of Turkey, rather, and the western border of Syria. Now, are these requests made for tangible NATO help, Sammy, and for Patriot missiles, made in the knowledge that it's unlikely ever to happen and it would be the worst thing that could happen if it did? I think to answer that question, we have to remember why Russia and Turkey have become good friends in recent times before this escalation, which is both were isolated. Turkey felt alienated by the US and by the Europeans. It didn't want to stay by itself. There was the election, the municipality elections. They lost Istanbul and, uh, and Ankara domestically. Erdogan said, I need an ally. Russia was under US sanctions. EU were given the cold shoulder to Russia. Two isolated partners, they came together. And that's why we saw the deal with the S-400s. In other words, the US is saying, Erdogan is coming to us now because he's isolated once more, because the Russians are also pushing him away. And this is why uh, this request for Patriot missiles has caused a lot of discussion in Washington. The, secret, the, 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 part of the State Department is saying, give him the Patriot missiles. This is a golden opportunity. Pentagon are saying, no way. Right, yeah. Because there are S-400s, there's no way we're risking the Patriot missiles. They just won't be able to do well, it. We, 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 we should yeah. bring yeah. Onur in at this yeah. point. You've, you've been very patient, Onur, yeah. yeah. sitting yeah. listening to this. I have a question for you in just a moment. But respond to this, if you, if you would. Turkey feels isolated, and uh, that's why perhaps it's, it's gone to the United States for these Patriot missiles. I could understand that statement to a certain degree, but this, the timeline of how things happen and when they happen certainly does not justify that. Uh, however, you have to understand and, and realize that, um, to, for me at least, unfortunately, Turkish foreign policy and Turkish military planning has been interdependent on the U United States for a very long time. Uh, starting with, uh, to my belief, with Clinton administration, uh, most of the Democratic uh, presidents along the way, even including the uh, even including George Bush, uh, has not been too favorable uh, upon Turkey when it came to this long-standing relationship, especially on the military side. So that's when that's when Turkey started looking for new partners to you know to, to keep up his her military uh, in the region. If you remember back in the day. This, there was a first try with the uh, Chinese uh, air defense systems, which I think was a little trick uh, by the Turkish government to pull the attention over there. But then they decided on the S-400s. And on the earlier comment uh, that Turkey is now signed up kind of in a pseudo way, a semi-detached member of NATO. Well, first of all, uh, if it wasn't for this Syrian uh, you know, ordeal that, that we're dealing with, I think we'll be discussing... Uh, NATO's, uh, you know, livelihood right now, whether it, it should cease to exist. Which, which is, um, and that's a fair point, because it's something we've discussed on this, this programme before. But I want to ask you about one specific incident. Two Russian sure. battleships, I'm afraid I'm not very good at knowing what a battleship actually is in this. It came down, I guess, from Odessa on the Black Sea, through the Bosphorus, down to um, Tartus. I believe it was Tartus rather than Latakia. Um, right in front of Turkey wiping Turkey's noses in it. Um, what, what was the response to what the Russians did there? Right through the Bosphorus, uh, basically saying we can do what we want. There were some rather weak voices as to why we didn't stop them. But you have to understand with the uh, Treaty of Montreux, yeah. uh, this is almost near impossible for us to do it uh, unless we declared war upon Russia. Or there's another amendment there that eventually will lead up to us saying that we will declare war on Russia. So, yeah, there were some weak voices inside Turkey, uh, kind of mad as to why would it intervene. Okay, so, so, but uh, according to Mantra, that was impossible. Can I ask Alexei, uh, you've been, been very patient too, uh, why you think Russia did this? Was it, was it a show of force, a gunboat diplomacy, as they used to call it? Well, I think it's uh, many messages here. And uh, first of all, Let's not forget, it's not the first time Russia sends its battleships. They are going uh, from Crimea to down to the Mediterranean, uh, back and forth. Uh, there is a rotation, military rotation. But, 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 not, but not when it had an argument brewing with Turkey uh, and it came I within mean, a half a mile of the coast of Turkey doing so. You may consider it as a coincidence and also as an intentional move to back up 
its uh, claims or its positions in Syria and especially on the coast uh, to showcase your uh, military build-up. So basically, that's a clear uh, demonstration of uh, force, one may argue. But also, if you look on the other hand, Russia, again, has no intention, uh, as well as uh, Turkey, I believe, no intention to go into large-scale confrontation or war. I mean, the two countries have already been uh, in that situation back in 2015 when uh, Turkey shut down Russian jet, and it took a year and a half to overcome yeah. uh, the crisis. And I don't think the two now in a position to uh, afford this break up or uh, escalation between the two, because uh, both will lose ultimately. OK, perhaps I'm, I'm casting expressions in the wrong place, but, owner, I think you've got your WhatsApp noise on because we keep hearing a ding-ding, which is just like my WhatsApp noise. If you could put it on to silent, that, that would be a great, great pleasure for all of us. Um, let's talk about the Mediterranean coast and North Africa when it comes to Russia's sphere of influence, because there it is in Tartus. It's moved these battleships down there. It's spending, I think, $500 million on that base. What is it going to do with what it has there? Well, it, it goes back to whether this was a violation of the Treaty of Montreux, which was finishing off the business of the Treaty of Versailles. It's about freedom of navigation, and you're, well, the gentlemen there are absolutely right. Uh, that, that's the cue. And it's about freedom of navigation, and there's a doctrine, whether you believe it or not, called AAD, Area Access Denial. So you take a chunk of sea and say it's your own. The Russians have been accused of doing this in the Sea of Azov, for example. But I agree um, about the sensitivity of the freedom of navigation of the Straits, of the Bosphorus. Is this a violation of Montreux? No, probably certainly wasn't. But by the way, NATO warships go up the other way quite frequently to establish freedom of navigation. Now, your point, absolutely right. The Eastern Mediterranean is roiling. As we have heard from other colleagues, it's, there's a big contest going on about indigenous offshore uh, uh, gas and oil, but particularly gas. We've got Turk Stream, and we've got a little fight, which is looking very unpleasant indeed, in Libya, which does threaten to become a new Somalia, where we've got a standoff. On the one hand, the Russians are supporting uh, albeit light touch, but with uh, Wagner Group uh, mercenaries, Khalifa Haftar in uh, Benghazi, whereas Turkey has been taking a position against the extremely feeble uh, government of national accord in, 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 in Tripoli. So, uh, and so you've got them. They're not, uh, they're not actually engaging, as far as I can make out at the moment. There are a lot of proxies and mercenaries. You've got to stand off there. But I just want to throw a really big bogger into the pond there. What we're seeing in Libya is as nothing to what we're likely to see in Libya by the end of the year, because the problem isn't the two Libyas, uh, Tripoli and Benghazi. It's what's coming up from the desert, and it's really kicking off right across the desert. Libya, Algeria, Sub-Sahara. And this is where it seems to me, and I do reproach our people, there are French troops there, well, or British program. troops there. No, Go but on. it relates to this. Nobody has a clue, a right. clue, what to do about let's, it. Let's do another half hour on, on that in particular. But, 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 I want but to there are about, Russian and local Russian, Mediterranean interests involved Russian in this. Russian and Turkey interests in Syria, where there is a, a clash, they're in opposing camps. Is what we're seeing in northeastern, northwestern Syria on Turkey's eastern border, a reflection of those tensions, do you think, Sammy? I don't, I don't think so. I, I think we have to ex exactly define. Russia and Turkey don't have that many differing interests in Syria. Turkey's biggest problem is the refugee crisis. If you're going to give Idlib to Assad, make sure I don't bear the economic brunt of the refugee crisis. Either the EU helps me or US help me or give me a safe zone to reset to the refugees. But I will not allow Assad to take Idlib until you solve this problem for me. That's the, in a nutshell. This is why I think we should not focus too much on saying that Turkey is going in because of the tragedy of Idlib. If there's a solution to this refugee crisis, Turkey will agree with Russia in a heartbeat. And and the reason why is because there are too many joint interests between Turkey and Russia. The Balkans, let me give you a classic example. Serbia has been looking to join the EU for ages. The EU tried to say that Serbia has to recognize Kosovo. Turkey and Russia invested heavily in Serbia. Serbia felt, oh, I've got another economic lifeline. I don't need the EU. I'm not going to recognize Kosovo. I'm not going to see to your, to your agreement. EU turned around and said, okay, you don't have to do it. Uh, then they, they are reneging on those accession. In Libya, 
uh, Turkey managed to bring Siraj and Haftar to Moscow, a diplomatic coup for Russia. If it hadn't been for the Russians hesitating slightly and the UAE going to Haftar and saying, don't worry, just walk out, just walk out. Putin has nothing he can do about this. Putin would have succeeded in this. My point is this. There are a lot of joint interests between Turkey and Russia, and we should not overblow what's going on in Syria. Turkey feels that it's cornered. In other words, the refugees, there are many, hundreds of thousands going towards the Turkish border, economic crisis, Europe doesn't want to do anything about it. Find a solution to this, and Russia and Turkey will agree. The reason why Russia doesn't want to offer support for Turkey in this is because Russia, as Robert said, doesn't want to overextend itself. I'm happy the way things are. I've got Tartus, I've got Levikia. I said in my pocket, NATO are alienating Turkey, there's no way to go back to Turkey. Putin is not losing anything in the Syria conflict. And this way, when you bring in Libya, when you bring in the East Mediterranean, the biggest loser is Europe, which has no idea what to do in Syria, no yeah. idea what to do in Libya or in the East Mediterranean. And the bully in Europe today is France, which is saying to Germany, listen, we have to antagonize Turkey. We have to go into Libya and support Haftar. And Europe is like, whoa, whoa, let's, let's talk about this. And while they talk, calamity is on its doorstep. I, I have to go back to Ona on, on, on this one. Do you agree or disagree with the fact that Turkey and Russia interests are much, much closer than uh, we should, than they, than, than they appear, uh, given the tensions of the last few days? I mean, call this simple look at a complex matter, but I totally, totally disagree. Um, as I said, just by simple looking at it, I believe uh, the Russians uh, by far, uh, not the most major, but probably only stake in, in Syria is to, you know, after three, 400 year dream, to be in the warm waters. When it comes to Turkey, uh, Turkey is another, you know, it was also simple, to make sure its border security is set and to make sure there's no mass migration uh, from mm. Syria as there's, there's already been. So I think these are totally two different ways. Now, we could take this idea, we could take these two ideas and take it out to a level where, you know, in the future, very near future, <clears throat> Syria could also be a very major factor for the uh, for the security of the uh, Western Mediterranean hydrocarbon reserves, but Turkey just by just physically, uh, by geography, does not need that. So, uh, when it comes to Syria, I, I do see both Turkey and Russia to have totally different <coughs> interests and 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 dreams. Quite possibly, but not not in other areas necessarily. Um, Absolutely not. Alexei, um, there's a line, I think it was in today's or yesterday's Guardian, that says Moscow will eventually want to stand down in this confrontation, but Turkey needs to do so sooner. So Russia knows exactly what it's doing. Uh, well, uh, I mean, again, I'll repeat myself. Uh, the, the, the major Russian interest now is not to allow this current escalation to slide into complete chaos. Because if there would be, I mean, let's just hypothesize, if there is a direct, uh, like, uh, conventional full-scale war between Turkey and Syrian army, that uh, basically ruins all Russian, current Russian strategy and actions in Syria. I mean, that won't allow Moscow to monetize on its uh, already uh, military successes and won't allow to bear any... Uh, dividends or return of uh, on its investments it already mm. over the five years. Uh, yeah, and, and the same article, if I could interrupt, Alexei, said um, uh, Vladimir Putin is determined to hand over the smouldering ruins of Syria to a puppet leader whose strings are pulled by Moscow because gas, oil, uh, the lucre of reconstruction and all the other things that he really wants, plus that foothold in, in the Middle East, would necessarily follow. Well, it's, it's all very complicated. And also, I want to highlight, I mean, I wouldn't go that far saying that Moscow-Damascus relations are like master and proxy. Uh, Damascus doesn't do anything that Moscow says. Uh, in, in, in certain sense, um, Damascus is in a very uh, comfortable position here because it understands it cannot... Uh, I mean, Moscow won't withdraw from Syria, basically saying, OK, if you don't do this, we will, you know, uh, stop supporting you. It's impossible to imagine. Russia already in Syria and cannot afford itself to to uh, back off. Okay, so, so, so I've got to stop you there because we're running out of time. So Assad is not ever going to be, is not at the moment, Moscow's puppet. No, it, it's too unpredictable and he'll do his own thing, but time will run out to him. I just want to throw something in that I think that the great destabilizing factor it's run throughout our conversation is the refugees. 
and we now think there are four million plus total in play. Now imagine coronavirus, COVID-19, really grips that population. It's going to destabilize that region and a lot more in a way we can scarcely imagine at the moment. OK, final, final words, Sammy. We don't have very long. This is going to blow over pretty quickly? I think it will, it will blow over. But I think Turkey now, uh, we talk about it being isolated. And it is isolated. But that doesn't mean Turkey is weak. Turkey now exerting itself in northern Syria. If, let's suppose, go to scenario, Turkey takes Idlib. The game changes slightly. The problem is that Turkish policy tends to be very cautious. Turkey has had golden opportunities in the region to really exert itself, but it's always limited itself to security concerns, Kurdish armed groups, refugees, and the like. If Turkey is bold and ambitious, it can actually flip the tables on Russia in Syria. But the question is, how ambitious is Ankara, and how, what's the extent they will continue the operations in Syria? Um, for that, we will have to wait and see. Listen, thank you very much indeed from Istanbul, from, from Moscow, from, from here in the studio, Robert Fox, Sami Hamdan, thank you very much indeed, and thank you uh, for watching. March the 5th is a day to put in your diary if you're following this story. We are. Goodbye. <laughs>